Okay, good afternoon, everybody. People are still coming in. Um, thank you for being here. My name is Can, and I'm here with Linkso, and I have Lisa and Kathleen here again from uh, the Master Gardeners doing the spring and summer vegetable gardening uh, today. And um, we're gonna get right into it. If you have any questions, go ahead and type it in the chat and we'll try to address them towards the end of the talk. Um, and I think all your microphones should be muted. Um, if not, please do that. And uh, we'll unmute ourselves at the end um, for some discussions and Q and A's. Um, and welcome Lisa and Kathleen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks. We want to thank everybody for coming today. We know that after a year of Zooming, a lot of people are just totally Zoomed out. So thank you for showing up. Um, that's Kathleen on the left in the white t-shirt and I'm in the purple shirt um, and I'm in purple again today. <laughs> um, so I will go over what we're going to cover today. Um, so, and I'm sorry, I'm doing this on a PDF. So you'll probably see some things on my screen popping up and down, but um, we're basically going to be covering the why, where, when, what, and how to grow vegetables today. Um, and Kathleen and I will just kind of go back and forth. We're kind of the click and clack of the garden world. So we, <laughs> <laughs> we bump things off of each other. Um, we're also going to cover a little bit of uh, pest protection and tips on some spring vegetables. So this is a, an arrangement I did. Um, well, I know it's an April arrangement because it has artichokes and artichokes and asparagus are April vegetables because everything starts with A. That's how I remember that. Um, <laughs> but what about the kale? <laughs> yeah, that's ale, Kathleen. <laughs> <laughs> um, so why grow your own vegetables? So why, you know, kind of why show up today uh, in the middle of the day? And you know, basically it's because they're yummy. Um, when you grow them in your own garden, they're really, really tasty. And um, with my kids, I can't, I can't even buy uh, store-bought vegetables. They'll only eat vegetables from my garden. So I've got two teenagers and we really do use it like a grocery store. I mean, I put some pictures like five minutes ago on the presentation because for lunch, I went and picked some lettuce and I had a car, car orange and I made a vinaigrette and I had some roasted beets from last night from the garden. And so I, I, I go out there at least three times a day for kind of breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, so that's one reason. And then also when you're growing your own vegetables, you know what you've put on there. You know that you haven't sprayed with pesticides or insecticides. And um, so it's just kind of the assurity of knowing. And also your homegrown vegetables are higher in antioxidants and they're more nutrient dense. And I know there's some studies that say a Stanford study uh, that disputes that, but actually after some, some more research, um, what we have found, and I'll have Kathleen go over this slide with you. This is, <clears throat> excuse me, this is from the USDA. And this is in 1940 when they started using fertilizers, um, the decline in micronutrients that are found in our food. And I mean, it's huge. So this is why we um, encourage cover cropping and not using fertilizers. Yeah. Other than compost. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, so now we're moving into where to grow your vegetables. Um, and you really only need three things. You need sun and a lot of it. You need living soil and you need water. Um, the other things that are helpful to have are patience, um, <laughs> <laughs> which not everybody has, curiosity, and I know curiosity is kind of the word of the day. There's not a podcast I haven't listened to like in the last month that be curious, be curious. But um, it does really help. It helps with gardening to be curious. And I'd say of the, the one that's probably most important is power of, of observation. And that's really, um, Kathleen has a saying uh, from a book she read uh, from Dan Barber, but it's see what you're looking at. 
And uh, there is a little bit of a funny story <laughs> about this, but the observation really means keen observation of really noticing what's on your plant and noticing how your plant's doing, noticing is the soil wet, touching it, feeling it. Um, but yeah, one funny story, I don't know, it's like the power of observation. My husband went out to make himself a spinach salad. This was at the beginning of the pandemic. So he, he goes out to pick himself some spinach and he comes back, makes himself a big salad. And then he asked me later on, is spinach fuzzy? <laughs> like, no, spinach, spinach is not fuzzy. <laughs> he goes, well, does it have kind of a nap to it? <laughs> no. <laughs> I added my spinach right next to my, uh, my eggplant. My eggplant had come up. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> he made himself this gigantic eggplant leaf salad. <laughs> Did Which he get actually, sick? It's a little poisonous, but yeah. uh, he didn't he didn't get sick. But um I, I mean I think that's a small example of like see what you're looking at. I mean <laughs> plant has eggplants. <laughs> it's probably, probably not lettuce. <laughs> probably not spinach. Anyway, I thought that, <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. But um so your, your root vegetables and your leaf vegetables need about six hours of pure sun. That's sun hitting their leaves. Um, your fruiting vegetables like tomatoes, which are actually fruit, but would, tomatoes, cucumbers, um, they need eight hours. And Kathleen and I run into this all the time. Um, people, people will start saying, well, what about what about four hours, you know, well, what about, and I've, I've had master gardeners say to me, Kathleen and I are master gardeners. Um, well, that's only because you have full sun. You can say that. And I'm like, well, <laughs> <laughs> it's not really me. I mean, that's just what the plant needs. I'm, I'm not like saying that to be it's what the plant needs. Um, you can try to grow vegetables in less sun, you might be successful in some years, but they need they need so much photosynthesis to produce what they're trying to produce. So uh, I put there, you can try to negotiate with the plant, but the plant's gonna win. So tell them about your cauliflower, Lisa. Yeah, so I have eight beds right now um, and six of my beds are in full sun. Two beds get about half sun. I planted cauliflower in three different beds all at the same time. And uh, my cauliflower, I got about in the beds that were full sun, a good 30 days earlier, I got these big, huge heads of cauliflower, like seven pound heads of cauliflower. My cauliflower that didn't get, it still got, still probably gets eight hours, but it doesn't get the 10 or 12 hours that my other beds get. Um, I finally did get cauliflower from it, but it limped along and it had more aphids and I mean, it's not that you're not going to be successful. It's just going to take a lot longer and the, the plant's going to struggle a lot more if you don't give the plant what it needs. So, you know, it is what it is. I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> um, so that's where, and um, so where to grow your veggies. Um, so this is my, my new garden. Can you see my mouse, Kathleen? Yeah. Okay, so my new garden's on the left. My old garden is on the right. Um, so I planted in the past in the ground. And I will say in the ground, I got bigger vegetables. Um, I mean, I'd get broccoli that was standing four feet tall. Um, Cause it's in there with the native soil with the whole soil food web. And so it, you know, it, it's pretty powerful having all that life in your soil. Um, I work hard on my soil. I use a lot of compost, mulch, and but I like my raised beds too. So this is my new garden. I moved to Portola Valley about three years ago. So this is my Portola Valley garden. And I've got six raised beds, six in full sun, two in partial. And um, it's a lot more expensive because you have to build the raised beds, um, but you can control it a little bit better. You can control for pests and 
uh, like I have covers over my beds. And so there's pluses and minuses. It kind of depends, um, kind of depends on, on your budget. It's almost free to grow it right into the ground. Um, you don't need, you don't need much. You need irrigation and you need to have good soil. But um, Kathleen, do you want to add? Cause you grow in the ground. Uh, yeah, I put a garden in about three years ago and I put it in the ground because um, raised beds take up more space and I wanted more room because I cover crop a lot. And I figured farmers and plants have been growing in the ground for at least a couple hundred years, if not more, probably <laughs> like 2000 years, probably like 2 billion years. Yeah, so I figured I'm just going to put my plants in the ground. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, and for like a school garden or something where you don't want kids trampling on the soil, I think raised beds make sense. Um, yeah, and, and I will say for my herbs, I put them in a, a big horse trough. It's really big. It's like, and I just drilled holes in the bottom. Um, just because my dogs pee on the plants and yeah. I, you know, so there's that. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all righty. So where, oh, how much space? Then the other thing you have to consider is how much space do you have? Um, so I've been lucky enough. Um, so again, that's my old garden in Woodside from three years ago. And I had about half acre in vegetables and about a half an acre in fruit trees. Um, so I had plenty of space. I didn't really have to worry about space, but now I have a raised bed. And I, even with all the space, because I'm probably greedy. So that's my dad's house where those artichokes are. And I started <laughs> gorilla gardening over at his place. <laughs> so I planted a whole bunch of artichokes over there. But, um, now I'm in raised beds and uh, and so it's a little harder I have to think I just planted out as a matter of fact this weekend Saturday and Sunday I planted out all my spring vegetables and I had to be thinking I know in two months I'm going to be planting out all my summer vegetables and I have some broccoli that was fall planted that's going to seed right now so I tuck some broccoli in there and I'm probably going to plant some tomatoes in there in two months so I'll take out my fall planted broccoli. And the reason I'm going through all of this is you just have to keep thinking because in California, you can grow stuff 365 days of the year. And so, and everything's going to bump up against everything because I know my summer, my spring stuff that I just planted, all those brassicas, they're going to go all the way to October. I'm going to be having kale and broccoli and all those things through spring, through summer. Um, and so where am I going to put all my summer veggies anyway? So you have to be just thinking, can I tuck it in? I have a bed of bok choy right now. Well, it's almost done. It's about to go to flower. And so I know I can put some tomatoes in there. Um, but anyway, you just have to, you have to interplant. Um, and you just have to think, where's everything going to go and how am I going to stuff it all in? Um, um, anyway, Kathleen, do you have anything to add to that? No, just that you, you always have to be thinking like three or four months ahead of what's coming next. If, if you're in raised beds, if you're in the ground, less so, um, just because raised beds limit your planting space. I mean, if you're in the ground, your planting space is limited also, but it's less limited. Yeah, yeah. And I would say if you're trying to figure how much space do you need, uh, we're a family of four. And I would say four raised beds is about right for a family of four. Um, and Kathleen, did you want to talk about crop rotation? Yeah, I, I would say you need a minimum of three raised beds in full sun so that you can rotate your tomatoes and plants in the tomato family through each. You can put one in 
that family in one raised bed every summer. Yeah. So and you want to change raised beds that you put your tomato family in every summer. Yeah. And we'll get into crop rotation a little bit later. Um, and the only other thing on this point, although we cover it later too, is um, your fall your fall and your spring, you're planting the exact same thing. You're, and we'll get into that, but you're planting brassicas, you're planting the amaranthaceae family, um, but they're gonna act very differently. A September planted broccoli is gonna go to flower in December, January, February. Yeah, mine's flowering right now. Yeah, mine's flowering right now too. I'm still eating all the side sprouts. But a spring planted broccoli that let's say the exact same variety, Marathon, a spring planted broccoli can go all summer long. So a spring planted broccoli you might have for six, seven months, but a fall planted same variety broccoli you're probably gonna have for three months. So keep that in your thinking too of um, how long just if you're going, if you're planting warm into cold, September into December versus cold into warm, February into April, May, June, um, you're going to have a different response from the exact same plant. So moving on, Kathleen, do you want to do soil food web? Yeah, it's very important. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> um, can you see my mouse? No, I can't see your mouse. Okay. But you can tell me what to point at. Okay, point at the plants because the, the plants are the whole engine that feeds the soil food web. The plants slush, slush off 30% of the carbohydrates they make from the sun, which is the most amazing thing in the world. And it's why we're all here and alive is that photosynthesis. So just... I want to put that out there. It's if you want to believe in miracles, that's the miracle to believe in is photosynthesis. So plants take the energy from the sun and they make carbohydrates and they give 30% of those carbohydrates to the soil, to the, the life in the soil and the fungi and the bacteria give food to the plant, which is why I don't fertilize. I keep my soil very alive with roots in the ground always because it's liquid carbon and it feeds the whole soil food web which keeps your plants healthy all right should i go to next sure so the more uh diverse your crops, the better, the more diversity you can grow. It's like if all you ate was hamburgers all the time, you're not going to get a good diet. Well, it, the same is true of your soil. You want to plant different things, as much diversity as possible. We saw I'll let you talk about rotating crops. Okay, well, we get to a slide later on uh, crop rotation and cover cropping. So we could um, I can tell a funny story. <laughs> um, and Kathleen will get into a little bit of crop, um, cover cropping and mulching. But the main point here is keep your soil covered. Whether it's mulch, um, better if it's crops and better if it's plants, better if it's root in the ground from what we just learned that the roots are feeding the soil and you want to feed your soil. But keep your soil covered. Don't have bare soil. and um, Here's something to help you remember that. It's my niece, Megan. <laughs> she's, now, she's now 30 years old, but when she was four, she was going to preschool and she told her mom, I want to go to school naked today. And her mom said, okay, you can go to school naked. So she got in the car naked. They drove to preschool. Comes time to get out of the car and Megan's not so sure she wants to get out of the car naked. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, Annie had packed uh, some clothes, so she didn't have to go to school naked that day. But I just, whenever I see bare soil, I think of my, my niece, Katie, I mean, uh, Megan, uh, don't leave your soil naked. You do not want naked soil. Your soil needs to be covered, just like you need to be covered. When you go out, you need to cover yourself. <laughs> 
so keep your soil covered. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, raised beds. Um, we do not work for Linkso. We have no affiliation with Linkso. But um, if you are going to do raised beds versus in the ground, I would really highly recommend Linkso's Veggie Blend because it is by far and away, uh, it's a very, it's a good mix of distal structured compost and um, fur, fur, uh, yeah, can would know, I think. Um, yeah, uh, for a fur bark. Fur bark, and it's really terrific, terrific stuff. So if I, um, we'll get into composting and stuff. So I'll let you go on, Kathleen, with why feed the web. Okay, I, I will say one thing about Linkso's veggie blend is I was working for a new client and we built the raised beds and found the location. It was in full sun and we filled them with Linkso veggie blend and she complained to me that we had too much production. <laughs> so if you want to have too much production, use Linkso's veggie blend. <laughs> True. So why feed the web? We've been talking about this, but you want to go over why you feed the soil, Kathleen, instead of feeding your plant? Yeah. Well, if you have healthy soil, you're going to have healthier plants. And healthy soil means that it's high in organic matter, that it's alive. It's one teaspoon of soil has billions of organisms in it. You won't need to water as much your water will, will infiltrate down into your soil and you'll have good soil structure. I will say I'm in Santa Cruz and we just got four inches of rain in the last storm. And I had no puddling in my backyard or front yard um, because I've been working on my soil. I have really good structure and the water just goes right in there and it's going to go and recharge the water table what yeah. my plants don't need yeah. and then the healthy soil is going to grow a healthy plant yeah. so you're going to have more nutritious vegetables you're going to have nutrient rich vegetables um, and with a healthy plant you don't need pesticides or herbicides or or fertilizers um, the plant then well it's really the microbes taking care of the plant you just have to take care of the microbes and uh this is also when I tell my story about don't step on your pets. Um, so these microbes are like little, you should think of them as little pets that you're trying to water and feed. And just like you wouldn't step on your dog, don't step on your soil unless you have to. <laughs> or you well, could I, think of them as farm animals. Yeah, think of the little microbes as farm animals. But you don't want to comp the, the number one killer of microbes in your soil is compaction. That happens from stepping on it. That happens from blowing it with the blower. Uh, actually, the rain, the rain falling on it. All those things compact your soil. And that's why you keep your soil covered. Keep it covered with cover crops. Keep it covered with mulch. Uh, OK, Kathleen Gabe Brown. Yeah, Gabe Brown is, is the um, regenerative agriculture. You know, it used to be sustainable agriculture. And Gabe Brown is in North Dakota. And he looked at his soil and he thought, why would I want to sustain this? This soil is awful. So he started regenerative agriculture. And he is huge into cover cropping and the diversity of cover cropping. And he he grows like 20 to 24, I think he's even gone up to 80 different types of plants in his cover crop. Wow. But he has five things you need to do. Disturb your soil as little as possible so you don't till it or step on it. You always want roots in your soil, always. You want a diversity of plants and cover your soil. If you don't have something growing, then you should have it mulched. And he says incorporate animals. He's a farmer, so he has chickens and cows. And if you can't incorporate animals, which most of us can't, um, what I do is I mow my cover crop. 
periodically, which would be the same thing as an animal going through and eating it. What that does is it, uh, it tells the plant to grow more and it puts more carbon into the soil. So they, they need to be stressed a little bit. So if you do have cover crops, mow them down on occasion and they'll grow, they'll grow back clearly. And they'll also, their roots will grow as well as their tops. Yeah. And if you want to watch, um, no, he, Gabe Brown has a good book, Dirt to Soil. Yeah, it's a really good book. Um, which is, that's what he did with his farm in North Dakota, like 20 years ago or something. And uh, he's, he's a great, anyway, great guy. I don't know if you guys have watched Kiss the Ground. Would it came out earlier this, um, like kind of early in the pandemic. And um, uh, Woody Harrelson is the um, moderator. It's really good. It's actually Tom Brady's in it, even speaking of like Super Bowl championship people who uh, eat healthy food and some other movies are living soil um, symphony of soil but we're I know we're spending a lot of time on soil and we'll get to veggies pretty quick here but it's really the foundation of getting good vegetables is having uh, a live living soil yeah when when Lisa and I go and look at a garden I would say uh, probably 80 percent of the time the issue is soil yeah. yeah. The yeah. other 20% is sun. Done. Yeah. All righty. Oh, benefits of cover copy. Well, we've talked a lot about this, but you want to say anything more, Kathleen? Um, I think we've got it. I think the other, one of the main reasons why I cover crop is also that you can sequester carbon into, and if you watch the movie, um, Kiss the Ground, it talks a lot about climate change and how we can sequester carbon in the soil. And it actually benefits our soil and it benefits our plants. And if you can put enough carbon in the soil, you don't need to fertilize. Yeah, so recarbonize. Another good movie is The, the Biggest Little Farm. Yeah, that's a great movie. That's a good movie. Uh, okay, well, I think we've talked enough about cover crops, but rotation um when i was planting in the ground and i had i had row crops because i had um 25 foot rows i would make sure that i was always rotating my crops so i wouldn't put brassicas brassicas are kale cabbage cauliflower um kohlrabi uh, broccoli. bok choy broccoli um those are all brass those are the superstars right now it's what you guys are planting or should be planting um and we'll get into that in a minute but um so i do you know so many rows of brassicas so many rows of beets or spinach which is in the same family chard and then i'd make sure that i wouldn't plant back with that same crop um now that I'm in raised beds, it's a little harder to do. I interplant a lot more. Um, but what I do make sure is that if I plant tomatoes, the whole Soliancia family, that I don't go back the next year. I actually give it a three-year break. I don't go back the next year with nightshade, um, with the nightshade family. So um, peppers, eggplant, tomatoes. I make sure I rotate those to a new, a new box every. Uh, every three years. And the reason for that is the the nightshade family are very susceptible to verticillium wilt. And if you get verticillium wilt, you can, I think it's 27 years um, before that verticillium is not going to be an issue in that box. Yeah, which we should mention, just be careful where you buy your seedlings. Um, make sure you're not bringing verticillium into your garden from a nursery. Um, we'll get in a little later some some good reputable nurseries um, or grow them your own, you know. Yeah, if you grow them yourself, you know they're good. Yeah, end of February, that's where I start seeding my tomatoes. So, okay. And I should mention you guys, everybody will get this slide deck. Um, I'll send it to Can and Can will get it to everybody so you don't have to take notes. Um, you know, what we should say, though, about cover cropping is um, like if you're putting legumes in your rotation, but you want the legumes to just add nitrogen to your soil, which 
a lot of people, that's how they use a, a fava bean. Um, like right now, it's so beautiful. All my fava are blooming right now. Yeah. Um, and I want them to bloom. I'm going to let those go to seed because it's a, it's a crimson. It's a really beautiful fava. But normally, I actually wouldn't let them go to flower. I would do what's called chop and drop. And I would just go with my garden shears and just chop them from the top going down. Let all that um, be a mulch. Just let it drop to the ground. I'll leave the roots in the ground and have that mulch my, my area. So uh, I cover cropped all my fruit trees and all that fava. And I did it with other things too. I have alfalfa in there and I have some radishes. So I'm just chopping and dropping all that right now. So that forms a nice mulch over the, um, around my fruit trees. Yeah, you just take your head shears and just go chop, 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 chop and just leave it. Chop and and chop. leave the roots. Always leave the roots in the ground because um, the life in your soil, their favorite thing is living roots. Their second favorite thing is dead roots. And their third favorite thing is mulch. <laughs> uh water irrigation um do you want to cover irrigation Captain? yeah here is your best irrigation meter <laughs> is your finger i know there's all kinds of devices you can buy that you know unless you want to spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars they're not very reliable um and i used to work in retail nursery and i would ask people well, how often are you watering? And almost always they would say, well, it's on a timer. And that's not an answer. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't tell me how often or how long you're watering. So you need to know, you know, even if your gardener controls your irrigation timer, you need to know how much water we went to a place last week. And I mean, there's moss growing everywhere. I can tell you it was way overwatered. I water my vegetable bed when it's in full growing season twice a week for about 30 minutes and I have in the middle line. Um, and if you can water in the morning and another thing Lisa and I see a lot is a closed loop irrigation in raised beds. I'm not sure why gardeners do this, but don't do it. What you want is at the top of your bed, you want a half inch, um, a half inch line and you plug into that quarter inch emitter line with a six inch spacing on the emitters and then just plug the end or put a clean out, um, a little clean out dripper on the end. And it's, it's easy to, to pull up when you need to add compost and mulch. Whereas a closed system is very difficult to work around. So that's. And it's not necessary. If you ever need to clean out your lines, you can just, this is probably tea tape, but um, if you just have an emitter line with a little plug on the end, you could just take the plug out if you ever need to clean out your lines. Uh, okay. Now when, when to, when to do what? Um, Yay. Yay. So, um, <laughs> my next slide is going to be my chart. But before I get to my chart, I'll just um, December and January, you don't do a heck of a lot. Um, I mean, you can harvest, obviously, but you're not planting. You're just sitting on your hands waiting for February 1st to hit. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I was doing. I have my chart you can't see, but right next to my desk, I have my growing chart. I, I like stare at it. I've had the same growing chart for, for years and years. I can't believe I still look at it every day, but I do. And um, I just sit there like waiting like an excited child for Christmas for February 1st to hit. And then I go to town. Um, so this weekend was kind of first weekend in February and um, well, Kathleen, you probably gave me like 50 seedlings. I had already bought about 50 seedlings and I planted. Um, and we'll talk about bed prep and, and um, having compost on hand and all that. But so you're planting right now. This is like the perfect time for you guys to be in this class. Right now is when you're doing all of your spring stuff. And we'll go into what, what that means, what you should be planting right now. But um, 
So February, March, maybe a tiny bit into April, you can plant all your, um, like I say, we'll get into a chart, but all your brassicas, all your amaranthaceae, your lettuces, um, and then save some space because late April, May and June, you're planting all your summer stuff. So you're planting all your tomatoes and cucumbers and eggplant and your beans and um, peppers. Peppers. So uh, you're just gonna have to think how you're gonna interplant that with all your spring stuff because you know your spring stuff's gonna go all the way to fall. So you just have to think that through. And then come August, September, you're planting all your fall stuff. And that's gonna be your, your warm growing into your cold, which is your back to your spring planting crops, which is back to your brassicas and amaranthaceae. Um, so I always think of gardening in three seasons um, in California. I'm planting kind of February, March, planting again, April, May, planting again, August, September. Um, before I plant out, we'll go into prepping your bed, but I always, always have compost on hand because before I plant anything, I put more compost onto my beds. Um, uh, one and little, go ahead, Kathleen. Well, I was gonna say, um, I have several clients and I have them always have compost on hand as well because I, I don't like bag compost. I like Lingso's diesel compost. And again, we're not paid by Lingso, but um, you don't need much. And they keep it in the shade covered. And then when I need it, it's just right there. And I don't have to worry about filling my car with plants and with compost. And it's, it's a wonderful thing. And if you're going to pay the delivery fee, you might as well get a significant amount because you're going to need it. Yeah. And if you don't have a big place to store it, I mean, you can just go down and bag it yourself. Like, and I think one bag of diesel compost, uh, can could answer it. I think it's like $10 or something like that. So, um, and really with the diesel structured compost, you need like a quarter inch or a half an inch. You don't, you don't need a ton. I, I use my own compost that I make. I use more because it's not quite as, as powerful. Um, <laughs> I put a note in here. I was just out in my garden before this class started. And um, I've never done this before, but I left a pepper plant in the ground, which I never do. But we're still eating peppers from this is a, you know, this is an April planted plant and I'm still eating peppers. Well, so they're perennials. Yeah, well, in Mexico, they're perennials. I wouldn't think there'd be a perennial in Portola Valley, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> um, one little note, um, follow tomatoes. So come fall, when you're, when August, September, when you're planting your brassicas, where your tomatoes are, um, tuck in a whole bunch of broccoli plants because broccoli has been proven by UC Davis to help reduce the risk of verdomcillium wilt. So, um, and, and no, crab, crab meal. Oh, crab meal, yeah. Also. Has helped, helped uh, reduce the risk. Of yeah, you do both. Yeah. Uh, alrighty, when to plant? Now, plant now. Now is Lisa's famous chart. <laughs> you can see my shadow. I'm not very good at making these photos, but, um, <laughs> At the end of the thing, you'll, um, I'm going to give you the link to this chart. It's the, it's the UC Master Gar Gardener Santa Clara County chart. And I have seen a lot of charts in my life. Common Ground had one. Uh, John Jeevens has one. Pam Pierce has one. Um, this is still my favorite. I've used a lot of charts and I love this chart. And so you can kind of see January. December, uh, not a lot to do. You just sit around. Um, I did just plant some asparagus, right? Here's asparagus. I did just put some asparagus crowns in the ground, um, but you're just kind of sitting and then look at February 1st, what you get to do. You get to do everything. You get to do <laughs> arugula, beets, bok choy, broccoli, cabbage, Napa cabbage, 
carrots, cauliflower, chard, cilantro, collards. So anyway, so all your, um, all those veggies, and you can see you get to do them again in September. So August, September. So your spring and your fall are the same. And then your summer stuff, which is in these middle and kind of in these April, May. Um, so you wait until April, May, and that's when you get to do your tomatoes, your sweet peppers, your winter squash, your summer squash, your peppers, okra, melons. Uh, so those are all summer, almost exclusive. Summer is fruit and spring and fall are, are actual vegetables where you're eating the vegetative part of the plant. Um, so I love this. You'll get this slide, but I'll also give you the link to how to go get it yourself. Um, and then you can color it yourself, just like Tell this. them what mom used to say. Oh. <laughs> so you don't <laughs> plant your tomatoes. You can see your tomato over here. They put it all the way to May. I usually start about April 15th. But our parents are both farmers. Um, and mom always said, uh, once you can sit in the ground with your bare butt, it's time to put your tomatoes in. So <laughs> <laughs> getting back to the naked bareness again. But that's anyway. the biodiversity method of planting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. So this slide I made myself, and I love this slide. This is one of my favorite slides. Um, so here's all on the left hand side's all your warm stuff. And it is happiest between 65 and 85. Uh, so that's all your summer fruits, basically. One grass in there. Um, and then on the other side is all your cool stuff. So that's all your spring and on all your fall plant and stuff. So, and the superstars are your brassicas, the mustard family. Everything we just said, arugula, bok choy, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, blah, 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 blah. Um, Amaranthaceae, which used to be called the Goosefoot family, it's now called Amaranthaceae. Uh, beets, chard, spinach, quinoa, amaranth. Um, I should mention here to eat. If you don't eat arugula, don't plant arugula. If you don't eat Brussels sprouts, don't plant Brussels sprouts. I mean, I know that sounds really basic, but um, a lot of people, you know, you'll walk into a nursery and they'll be, uh, a six pack of amaranth and you'll think, wow, it was so pretty. But do you eat amaranth or seeds? I mean, some people do, but um, so anyway, plant what you like to eat. If you like to eat broccoli, but you don't like cauliflower, plant broccoli, don't plant cauliflower. Um, the sunflower families, your lettuce, um, artichokes are perennial. So I'm not really talking about perennial so much today um, and carrots. Um, and that whole family, um, carrots, parsley, parsnips. I love parsnips. Um, and so you, you'll notice between the warm and the cool, there is an overlap here from 65 to 75 where uh, your warm things are okay and your cool things are okay. And that's kind of Northern California. We, we have a lot of those temperatures. That's why we can grow so much so, so many times of the year. Uh, anything to add, Kathleen? No, I think that's, I think that's good. Okay. And these are all done by families. You probably guys figured that out, but Solancia is a family. Cucabrits are a family. Fabrici are a family. Brassicas are a family. A family means they're related to each other. Um, how to plant. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to mention, because we see this a lot, um, Perennials, which um, go on forever and ever, like a tree or a bush. You want to plant those high. You want to plant those above grade. Annuals, like vegetables, um, and they just last one season. You, plant, you can plant them low. So when you plant a tomato plant, um, and it could be six or eight inches tall, you can bury the whole thing except for the top little few leaves. It'll root throughout that whole thing. But same with broccoli, same with everything. So you, you plant your annuals low, plant your perennials high. So kind of remember, sell high, buy low. Um, perennials high, annuals low. Um, <laughs> we, we see that mistake a lot with people and their fruit trees. They plant them way, way, way too low. Yeah. So um, you don't need a lot. I actually have my little, 
I have my little basket right here. Um, my little basket full of everything you see on my slide. But um, in my basket, I have my my ARS pruners. I love my ARS pruners because you only need one hand to um, to open them. And I have my soil knife. Some people call it a hurry hurry. Um, hurry hurry, I think. Oops, sorry. Hurry hurry. And uh, well, because it's pruning season right now, I have my my uh, pocket boy, my little thing. And then Kathleen gave me this. Um, it's my sharpener for my for my uh, pruners, and it's a uh, it's this diamond DMT diamond sharpener. So keep your pruners sharp, and you just go one way at a 45 degree angle. You can probably hear the noise that that makes. You should hear the noise that that makes. If not, it's time for a new sharpener. Yeah. And Kathleen gets mad if my sharpener, if my pruners are not super sharp. And you can tell if, you're, if your uh, pruners aren't sharp enough, at, your cuts will have a little fringe on the edge. If you see a little fringe, like little hairs, on the edge of a cut you've made, it's time to sharpen your pruners. Yeah, and that's more for, we're doing a lot of pruning right now. We're doing a lot of fruit tree pruning, so. But you want um, them sharp even when you're like cutting stuff off your vegetable plants. Yeah, your broccoli and, and whatnot. So um, uh, kind of my point though, I don't have, that's kind of my garden tools. Um, you don't need, I mean, if you're one of those gadget people and you love a ton of gadgets, okay, well then, you can buy more stuff if you want to, but I kind of have four things in my gardening basket. And that's even during pruning season. I mean, I might, I wouldn't have a pruning saw in there if it wasn't pruning season, but, um, and gloves, I wear gloves on occasion, not, uh, not that often, but, um, so how do you plant? I put it in here. You just, you put your, your hand trowel or your, your um, garden knife in, you just pull the soil back, pop the little plant in and uh, you don't really even have to tamp down, but uh, just put just the make sure there. there's soil contact. Yeah. Soil contact with the roots. It takes maybe, I don't know, five seconds or something per plant. I mean, it's, it's just like, choo, 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 and you just keep going. Um, and we'll go into uh, uh, prep. Anything else on how to plant? Tools. No, I think that's pretty good. I don't wear gloves either. Okay. How uh, seeds and starts. Um, so here's, uh, yeah, I do it both ways. I've started some broccoli seeds. They're up. They're not quite ready to be put in the ground yet. Um, so you can, you can start things from seed, which is a lot less expensive. Um, but you really should have done it like six weeks ago for fall for, excuse me, for your spring planted veggies. But at the end of February is when I seed all my summer stuff. So that's when I seed all my tomatoes and eggplant. And it's just a lot, you know, depending on your budget, it's just a lot. And you can get a, you can get a greater variety of plants if you go with seeds, seed yeah. yourself. Yeah, true. You get all sorts of really cool variety. I mean, there's probably a <laughs> hundred different broccolis. Um, so you don't have to just do Waltham broccoli or whatever. So, um, so that part's fun. It's fun to play around with it. Um, if you are going to buy seedlings, like right now, I just went to Wegmans. Kathleen just went to Half Moon Bay Nursery and San Lorenzo Hardware. Um, you just go to a good nursery and your seedling should look something like that. Um, it should still be little. It should be as tall as it is wide. You don't want something that's been... Um, trying to find sun and hasn't been able to find sun. You don't want something where it's root bound. You can pop it out, pop it out of its six pack and look at its roots, make sure it's not all root bound. Um, so right when they come in, and Kathleen, when do they come into the nurseries? Like what day of the week? Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Okay. I, I try to go to the nursery um, Friday morning, sometimes Saturday morning, depending on my schedule. Monday is the worst day to go to the nursery because they've just had the whole weekend people buying out their plants. Yeah. 
Um, so if you're going to do seeds, just always know you have to be six, you know, you have to be thinking six months ahead, but you need to be seeding at least six weeks ahead um, to get a nice little seedling that uh, you can pop into the ground. Um, that's my son, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> He doesn't he's look now like that teen, anymore. <laughs> he's now a teenager. We used to have, uh, at my old house, we used to run a farm stand and he was the cashier of the farm stand. Um, sowing requirements. Um, so the term direct sow means you put the seed directly into the ground. You're not starting it in flats. Um, and all your root crops, carrot, beet, um, turnip, radishes, parsnip, rutabaga, um, all your root crops, um, if you really shouldn't, I mean, whatever. I mean, you can buy seedlings for those, but it's really easy just to pop those right into the ground. And I put the dates there of when you want to do that. Like I just seeded my beets uh, this weekend. I just seeded them. Um, I don't really eat rutabagas and turnips, so I didn't seed any of those. Um, haven't seeded my carrots yet, so I'm going to get to that. Um, and then you can either start in flats or you can direct sow. To me, I, I just direct sow arugula and lettuce. I did that this weekend. Um, kale, I actually start that in flats. Uh, spinach, I direct sow and start in flats. Uh, fava bean, I just direct sow. I don't start that in flats. Um, peas, direct sow. Peas, yeah, I just direct sow peas too. Yeah, and what must be started in flats if you're gonna seed instead of buying a seedling. Um, all these are kind of fussy prima donna ish and actually bok choy I don't agree I need to move that over to you can I direct so bok choy all the time and it comes up just fine so and but mizuna the, yeah mizuna yeah I guess that's your mustard greens mustard greens so I would just direct sow those brussels sprouts I think they're kind of fussy and uh, uh, but the other ones I would start in flats if you're going to seed um bed prep <laughs> so this was me this weekend i decided to take some photos um so kathleen got me a bunch of seedlings and i bought some seedlings and i bought myself some a rhubarb and some um, asparagus and so i was ready to go but before i do anything i go and get my compost so i am um, i do my own compost and then i get compost from my dad's house he has horses and so I just compost his um, horse manure and wood shavings. And then I do my own just normal backyard compost. And so I go and I get a, a wheelbarrow of that and I roll it around to my bed. This was full of bok choy, but the bok choy was going to seed. So I gave it to my chickens. And um, so this is my, my soil and I put compost now i use kind of a lot i use probably three or four inches of compost on top um and then i got all my compost in so now i'm on the lower left here and you do and then you i lay out in, do you turn it in lisa or do you just put it on top um i've done both i don't turn it in but i i might i might uh just slightly maybe to the top one inch of soil um uh-huh turn turn it in a little bit are you just putting yours on top kathleen yeah i just put mine on top yeah the life in the soil will come up and get the compost and and bring it on down to the roots so you don't um you don't need to turn it in um here's some little these are marathon broccoli that's my favorite spring planted broccoli um, cause it just keeps going like the name says. And I just, I do it about 12 inches apart. Um, now if I was in the ground, I'd probably do it more like two feet apart instead of one foot apart. Do you, Kathleen, how far apart do you plant your broccoli? Oh, yeah, probably about two feet. All right. So I planted it all in. It's kind of in a honeycomb pattern. And then I water it in. There's my dram redhead. Um, <laughs> And it has a thousand little holes in it. And so it's like, it's like, it was hard to take this picture because I had to hold my camera. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, 
it, it's like rainwater. Because it's a really nice, gentle water. Yeah, it's D R A M M, Dram Redhead, and um, and there's my garden. And then I put my husband made these little things for me. And actually, we'll see it a little bit later on when we're talking about protection. But um, little covers because what I find is the birds like to eat the little brassica seedlings. And okay, so that's how you prepare a bed. Direct sowing, we kind of went over this. Direct sowing means you just put the seed right into the soil. And you, you don't have to do them very deep. In fact, when I cover crop, I just throw the seeds out. Even when I'm direct sowing other things, I just throw the seeds out and just sprinkle some soil on top. They don't need to be deep, except favas. Favas need to be pretty deep. Yeah, they say the, um, is it the diameter? But anyway, as big as the seed it is, is how much it needs to be planted. So like little brassica seeds are probably an eighth or a 16th of an inch. So that's how deep it needs to go into the soil. Whereas a fava bean could probably be a half inch to three quarters inch. So it needs to go down a little bit further. Yeah. Um, I do cover my seeds. After I plant my seeds, I'll either put floating row cover, which is this white right here. Um, or I've rediscovered tool and I, um, I'll have a slide on that later. Spacing, you know, you just look at what they say from the, uh, uh, from the nursery on the little tag or on the seed, on the seed package. But uh, for raised beds, I kind of follow uh, this chart for my, uh, for my spacing. Yeah, when I direct seed, I, I put it way closer than recommended and then I thin them. Yeah, oh, and then you can eat the tops, you know. Yeah. Once you thin them, eat them. This is kind of the honeycomb pattern um, or called offset planting, so you get more. Um, and yeah, plant them deep, uh, water well. After you, after you plant them, make sure you give them a nice drink of water. Uh, protection, bugs, blights, birds. So now we're moving on to protection and IPM. Um, do you want to talk about this, Kathleen? Well, I'll just talk about planting other plants, the hedgerow. Okay. okay. Um, I like to plant some natives and some umbels. Any, any plant that their flower is kind of flat on top and comes down like this like, um, well, carrots, but what's Queen Anne's lace? Is that an umbel? Yeah, though I don't, I wouldn't plant Queen, Queen Anne's no, lace. No, because it's invasive. But any, any plant that's an umbel flower, um, insects love those. And you want to attract insects, predator insects to your garden, um, beneficial insects to eat your damaging insects. So if you plant a hedgerow or some natives or, you know, some other stuff, then you will attract other, other insects that will help your garden. Yeah. So insects are good. Um, yeah. Like 99.9% .9 of insects are good. In fact, San Jose just released a bunch of little tiny predator wasps for the Asian citrus psyllid. Oh, okay. So insects are your friends. Yeah. Um, my brother just asked me, I was over at his house this weekend, and he said, um, oh my gosh, you know, my brassicas all have aphids. And I'm like, yeah, it's the end of their life right now. So, you know, your, your September planted brassicas are dying right now. They're going to flower. So you'll see them, like all my broccoli has gone to flower. And you're going to see aphids come in that's how it's supposed to be. They're putting off, a, is it a pheromone or a hormone? And they're saying to the world, I'm dying. Uh, here's your last chance, come and eat me. And so you're gonna get aphids on your late season stuff. That's just, that's how nature works. So I don't freak out about that. I just, if I wanna eat it, I wash it. Um, <laughs> Uh, sluggo, we do, when I plant out little seedlings, a lot of times I will put out sluggo, especially fall planted stuff. Um, 
And Sluggo is organic. I don't use Sluggo Plus. Um, because, at, because it has spinosad in it, which will kill all larvae. Yeah. So it, it'll also kill your earthworms. So Sluggo is good. Sluggo Plus, bad. Yes. So there's Sluggo right there. And then um, that's my cat. <laughs> <laughs> And my cat provides some protection too. But um, my screen, my back screen today is the same as this one. But um, so my husband built these um, little covers on at the top right right now. What I find is when the seedlings are little, they need some protection from the birds. And so I keep these covers on for maybe the first six weeks of life. And they're pretty handy and pretty easy. I can just take them right off. And because uh, then they no longer need uh, need protection. So um, there's other ways you can do it. The bottom left is actually a client of ours, and uh, her covers are also um, removable. And uh, does she have a rat problem, Kathleen? Uh, Kathleen? She does. Okay. So these are a little more permanent. Like you could go ahead and let your um, your broccoli and your cauliflower they are removable for when you want to do tomatoes and stuff, but um, I like hers. Those are easy to use. Um, so I think that's a good solution. Um, the bottom two right are my old garden. Um, and so that's called floating row cover. And that's to protect your seeds if you, if you seed. And um, I rediscovered tool. I hadn't used it in the last three years, but I love, you can just go to like Joanne's Fabrics or something like that. It's not very expensive. It's very inexpensive. Um, what I like about it is the sun can get through, water can get through, but the birds can't get through. So if you have little seedlings and you want an inexpensive way to protect them, I would, uh, I would say you could just go buy yourself some tool. T-U-L-L-E. Um, okay, rodent control, trapping. Yeah. <sighs> Rodents are tough. Yeah. I asked for a squirrel trap for Christmas and I got one. <laughs> Santa has been very, very good to me this year. <laughs> it's a have a heart. So it's a live trap. I could release the squirrel. I haven't used it yet. Um, my brother who's Buddhist, um, he traps a lot and then he releases their spirit into the stratosphere. Um, I don't know. I'm just going to have to say this is a personal decision for people. Um, yeah. And you can also hire someone to do it if you're not comfortable doing it. But if you have a big, uh, especially rodents, yeah. you're going to have to do something in, in your raised beds. You should put gopher, you should put hardware cloth underneath it so the gophers can't come up. That's one reason a lot of people garden in raised beds is because of gophers. Um, luckily, I haven't had a gopher issue yet, but um, yeah. you know, it's, it's tough to grow enough to share with the rodents. Yeah, the, the rats and the squirts particularly tenacious and yeah um, exclusion I mean this like this thing that my husband built that's exclusion so I I don't get rats and squirrels when I have that on once I take it off I have had squirrels or rats I don't, I don't know which one but they'll eat the bottom where the broccoli plant um, can be a great big huge broccoli plant I mean the circumference can be like three inches or something and a, a rat or a squirrel can eat all the way through the base of the plant and um, kill the plant. Yeah, they kill the plant, you know, and you think, oh, how did a gopher get into my raised bed when I have gopher wire at the bottom? Well, then you look at it and you see that um, it was a rat or a, a squirrel and it's, it's disheartening, you know. Um, I don't know, I think that's kind of like a personal decision type thing. Uh, harvesting. We're getting to the end of our talk pretty quick here, and then we can take questions. Um, you just have to remember harvesting takes time. Um, a long time. A long time. So I used to run, <laughs> I used to run a farm stand and these are my, uh, my baskets of farm stand stuff. And, um, 
it just takes, I mean, it would take me and like my, my kids would help. So like two helpers, um, but we could easily spend eight hours of harvesting uh, to get ready for a farm stand each. Um, so it just, it's, it's takes a lot of time to harvest um, and it's good to harvest. <laughs> I know that sounds kind of silly, but I mean, when you like right now, your peas, pick your peas and then it'll make more peas. Same with beans, pick more, it'll make more. Same with cucumbers, zucchini. You don't want the zucchini to get away and become you know, the 600 pound zucchini, you want to harvest them <laughs> time because you're going to get more zucchini that way. So just harvest, 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 just keep on top of it. Just keep harvesting, eat it. It's, it's delicious. It's and good. even broccoli, if you cut off the top, you'll get side shoots and it won't go to flower as soon. Yeah. So just keep it. Now cauliflower, there are some single serving like cauliflower beets. Um, they're single serving vegetables. So after you harvest it, it's gone. There's no more, but Broccoli, you cut off the main head, you get a whole bunch of side shoots and you just keep eating off of that broccoli plant forever, uh, for a long time. Um, so when you're harvesting uh, leafy greens like lettuce, spinach, kale, take the bottom leaves around the circum the bottom uh, closest to the soil and keep doing that. You don't wanna take the top middle part because um, that's where the little growing hormone is telling it to grow some more. And so you don't want to take the middle part out. Um, single serving. Oh, another thing with single serving vegetables, like let's say beets and carrots. When you, when you take five beets for dinner or something, then go ahead and plop five seeds back in. And then you'll just continue to have a harvest of your, your um, then you have beets forever. Um, if it's still the time to plant beets. Yeah, which you have like two, you have like a three month window. Yeah, you have like two three month windows. So half the time you can do it, not in the dead of winter or in the heat of summer. But um, anything else, Kathleen, about successive sowing or harvesting? Um, well, I have found that in the past I would go and plant everything all at once. And this year I'm, I'm going to plant a couple six packs of lettuce. And then in three weeks, I'm going to plant another couple six packs of lettuce just so it's kind of a successive planting. So everything doesn't come to harvest at the same time. Yeah. 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 There's nothing like you go out and there's 10 cauliflowers that all need to be harvested kind of that day. Yeah. I'm going to just mention something. Um, these cucumbers right here, people call them lemon cucumbers, uh, which it's not, it's a really nice cucumber, but I'm going to change the name to lime cucumber because they're so much better when they're smaller and green than yeah. when they're big and yellow. Yeah. They're so sweeter. They're sweeter and they're tender and they're delicious and crunchy. Um, so okay. don't wait till your lemon cucumbers become yellow and look like your lemon. Uh, and, general, oops, sorry. Well, actually, limes, you can, if you have a lime tree, you can wait until your limes look like that. Yeah. So think of limes as lemons and think of lemon <laughs> cucumbers <laughs> lime. <laughs> okay. I think this is our last slide. This, this slide will save you $100. Um, so we, Kathleen and I go on a lot of garden consultations and we find the same three things in every single garden we consult for. And um, so we're just gonna pass those along and then you don't have to hire us to come look at your garden. Um, Cause this is what we're gonna tell you. This is what we're gonna tell you if we were to come to your house. Do not let yourself, your gardener or your mow and blow person blow your soil. Don't do it, never do it. Um, leave your leaves. So when we see this at every single garden we go to, the mow and blow person is blowing the soil, maybe because the homeowner told them to, and they don't like the look of leaves on the ground. It's okay to blow hardscape, your patio or your driveway, but don't blow your soil. It kills your soil. It kills all the microorganisms in your soil. And then your soil becomes like cement. And we have seen this over and over. It's not like one time or two times. It's like every, every time, every single time. So 
don't do it. I'm sorry. I don't know a nice way to say that. <laughs> and the the uh, a deciduous fruit tree or uh, fruit or I'm sorry, a deciduous tree makes ninety nine percent of what it needs in the leaves that drop on the ground. So if you just leave the leaves that the tree drops, you don't need to fertilize that tree. It's like a big cycle. It's a the circle tree, of life. Yeah, the tree makes the leaves, drops the leaves, and uses the leaves as food and does it again and does it again and does it again. But when you take those leaves out, you're hurting your tree. You're taking away the food from that tree and you're killing your soil. So yep. you might have to adjust your thinking that, oh, it looks messy or get um, over it. <laughs> get over it. Move on. Move on.org. <laughs> You just have to get used. I love, you know, personally, I like the leaves being on the ground. I think it looks pretty. Uh, put a little sign so your neighbors don't think like you're um, doing it. I don't, I don't know. You know, if you live in like a fancy neighborhood or something, maybe you could use it as an education tool for your neighbors so they start doing it. So everybody leaves their leaves. Okay, enough about that. Um, okay, another thing we see all the time is people who are not qualified to prune trees are pruning trees and we see some really really bad cuts we see some things that make our heart just stop in its tracks and it hurts us actually to the point where sometimes we cry i so, have to tell lisa to don't look up <laughs> it like it like hurts my soul um so uh, hire yourself an arborist, a professional arborist who knows what they're doing and uh, do yourself a favor and have somebody who knows how to prune trees come and prune your trees or learn yourself. I mean, it's, it's, there's no magic to any of this. Um, you can learn yourself. You can take a class from Kevin Raftery at Foothill College. You can um, watch Kathleen's video on how to prune a fruit tree. Um, and I'd say pruning is half art and half science. And if you have a really good aesthetic eye, let's say you're a snappy dresser, you'll probably make a good pruner because you can learn the technical part of it. But after you prune a tree, it should look beautiful. It shouldn't look tortured. Um, okay, and then I've already talked about cover your soil. No naked soil. I already told my story about Megan. Make sure you cover your soil, either cover crop or have mulch on it at all times. That's what you need to do. Hard stuff. Um, <laughs> and then my very last thing before we go into credits is um, I always call February National Weeding Month, um, but it's really probably more like California Weeding Month. But, um, but this is the time before your weeds have set seed, go ahead and either pull them or cut off the tops. Or I, this is 30% um, horticultural vinegar. Can you see it? I'm disappearing. Yeah. Um, buy yourself some, um, don't spray Roundup. You guys know that already, but, um, buy yourself some 30% vinegar. If you feel like you have to spray, like you have between like pavement or something, um, you can't pull them and you can't cut them or something, then just spray them with 30% vinegar. Um, and that'll kill them. Um, yeah. and then mostly it's have fun. <laughs> So this was dinner last night. I went out to my garden and uh, we had beets, roasted beets, and then I made a chimichurri sauce um, for some smashed potatoes. They were like super, super good and some broccoli, some sugar snap peas. But I really, I honest to goodness, I use my garden like I would my refrigerator. I just go out there all the time and I'm always picking stuff. That's a gigantic bro uh, cauliflower I grew 10 years ago. <laughs> it took and like 10 months to grow. <laughs> The seed was from Italy. That thing was gigantic. <laughs> it was so huge. <laughs> but I grew, I grew some this year that were seven pounds each. Um, wow. Yeah, I gave some to a friend and he weighed it. And he's like, did you know that cauliflower is seven pounds? I'm like, oh, that's a lot of cauliflower. Uh, I have a good recipe with capers and um, lemon zest. It's really tasty. Mm. This was breakfast this morning. So I just took this picture literally right before the class started. So my quince is blooming in my garden right now. So I 
picked myself some quince and I had spinach omelet for breakfast, not an eggplant leaf omelet. And um, <laughs> then I picked myself some lettuce for lunch and I had um, some roasted beets and a lettuce salad with a citrus. I have a car car uh, uh, orange tree with a citrus vinaigrette. So it was pretty tasty. Um, here's the chart of the Master Gardener planting chart, which I love. Um, I love Pam Pierce's book, Golden Gate Gardening. Um, IPM, this is a great website, um, integrated pest management, ucdavis.edu. So if you have something wrong, just go to that website. They're, they're great. And then master gardeners are required by law to answer your question. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if that's true or not, but anyway, if, if um, let's see, here's, oh, before I get to their number, I'll get to that in a second, but I want to thank Linksos for having us today and providing the platform and can who is amazing awesome awesome can and um this is the number so if you have a gardening question you can just call the master gardener hotline and um if you don't reach a person in person then you can um they'll um they'll research it and get back to you if you just leave a message um and if they don't know the answer they do they research it they're great 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 and uh they'll get back to you so if you have any questions you can call the master gardener helpline or send them an email with photos or send them an email with photos and that's uh yeah their email address um and now can are there any questions yeah we're, we've got uh several questions in the chat here so i'll just go back and start from the beginning and might be a refresher for a lot of folks but um i'll start from top here so for those of us on the foggy coast, what's the definition of sun? Do we need bright, direct sunlight? Um, you know, fog, you can still get a sunburn in fog. So fog is not shade. Shade is the sun is being blocked by trees, buildings. The, the sun is being blocked by something. On the coast, though, your bigger issue is heat. So like all of the, the fall, spring stuff is great on the coast. It grows year round. You're gonna have more trouble with um, true fruit, which is tomatoes, eggplant, just because it doesn't get hot enough. But yeah, fog is not shade. Really, I, uh, that surprises me. I thought fog would not be the same as full sun. Well, it's it, as far as like where you're going to locate your garden. Yeah. Okay. Don't take fog into account. Okay. 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 All right. Um, let's see. So sun here in Florida can be too intense sometimes. So maybe root crops can survive with uh, muddled sun. Go Question no. mark. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's tricky because I know Northern California, well, I know the Bay Area, the mid peninsula of the Bay Area. Florida, I don't know, but I think they probably have master gardeners in Florida. Oh, no, no. Um, oops, I don't know. Susie might need to mute. Her. It, my computer's going to go down. Oh. <laughs> I just got news. Oh. Sorry. Oops. Oh. I'm not sure anyway. Um, you know, I don't know, but I can say heat and sun are not the same thing. So I've had my neighbor who said, oh yeah, yeah, my fruit trees are in full sun. And then I went and looked at them and they're planted like really close to an oak tree. And um, he goes, oh no, it gets so, so hot. And I said, I believe you, it gets so, so hot. Hot and sun are two different things. They're Sun means actually you're casting a shadow, like you stand in the sun and the sun is hitting you and you're casting a shadow. And sun is what drives photosynthesis, not heat. Right, okay, good point, yeah. <laughs> um, so this was referring to Kathleen, your raised uh, planter beds. Uh, people are wondering how big they are. And I think there was a reference there that you used a family of four, um, ideally four garden boxes. How big would you say, like what the dimensions are? Yeah, I think those are my raised beds. Uh, yeah. Or and, sorry, yeah, Lisa's. <laughs> um, you know, the ones, uh, my husband just built uh, four new ones for me and they're, 
They're four feet wide, uh, which is about right. Could maybe go a tiny bit narrower, but um, he just was doing it on the sides of lumber. And I want to say they're either 10 or 12 feet long. My other one, so I have four kind of bigger ones. Those are the bigger ones. My littler ones are eight by four. And eight I'd by say four is pretty standard. Yeah, I'd say for a family of four, eight by four, yeah. as, you know, again, if they're in pure sun, that is ideal. I, I have one client that has eight by eight boxes. Oh, those are hard. And it's really difficult to reach the middle. Yeah. Because yeah. you don't want to step on your soil, especially in a raised bed. Mm -hmm. So I kind of crawl <laughs> on my belly. <laughs> Which is nice and soft and not killing any microbes like a yeah. lizard so i distribute my weight more evenly than a footprint would yeah <laughs> and there are different like fun designs of like keyhole gardening where you just actually yeah. go in and you know you can get real yeah. creative yeah. yeah and and i mean my horse trough is probably two by four yeah and that works great too and that's really inexpensive mm -hmm. yeah and sometimes it just comes down to budget sometimes. But if you're building new raised beds, please remember to put hardware cloth on the bottom so the gophers can't get in and tuck it up on the side, on the inside, um, instead of just having it flat because the gophers will go in between the gopher wire, like quarter inch hardware cloth is the name of it. But make sure you, you tuck it up um, so the gophers can't get in. Okay. Um, tomato question. So when do you plant tomatoes? Is it by May 1st? And um, why do you need to rotate the tomatoes? We kind of went into that, but it might, we might have gone into it after the question was asked. But um, Mother's Day. I, I would say I plant my tomatoes in the mid peninsula, uh, April 15th. Um, but I'm where I get a little more frost in Redwood City, you could probably do it a little bit earlier than that. But I'd say late April, early May, you're you're good. Yeah. Kathleen? And, and well, Mother's Day is my deadline. If I oh. don't have them in by Mother's Day, I'm screwed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the reason you rotate is that family is especially susceptible to verticillium wilt. And if you keep planting the same plant in the same place year after year, you're increasing the chance that you're gonna have verticillium. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you break the cycle of that plant being in that place, and it's a, if you, you want a three-year cycle, so you plant it one year and you wait two years before you plant it again to break the cycle of verticillium buildup because a little bit of verticillium is not going to do anything. A lot of verticillium, it's um, quorum sensing. So a lot of verticillium is going to kill your plants and infect your soil for the next 27 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do you have plants for bees? I guess companion planting perhaps. I do. I have, like right now, my ceanothus is blooming like crazy and bees love it. And my broccoli that I didn't harvest in time and has gone to flower, um, I leave it in because the bees love that as well. And I, I just plant a lot of stuff. I do. I cover crops. So I, I always have something flowering in my garden. Yeah, I'd say the same here right now. And my man, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, Lisa and I just went on a garden consult, and I forgot to say this to our um, the person who we were seeing. He was using a systemic on his roses mm. because they had powdery mildew, black spot, rust, you know, everything roses get in this area. But there's research now that the systemic um, kills the bees. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if you're concerned with bees, don't use a systemic on your ornamentals and definitely don't use it on anything you're gonna eat because systemic means you you put it in the soil and the plant takes it up and it's it's throughout the entire plant. So don't don't do the Bayer three in one rose yeah. disease control, I think it's called. Yeah, it's very much been tied to the collapse of the bees. 
and we um, need bees because we have to have pollination. We won't have any fruits or vegetables if we don't have bees. Okay, so the next question is regarding soil or compost. So does broccoli need a lot of sun and can you plant just from compost that has turned to soil or do you need to buy soil and mix in with the compost? Broccoli needs a lot of sun. Can, I think you can answer that soil compost question better than we can. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's really up to uh, the individual, you know, some like a little bit more compost than the others. I know, Lisa, you had mentioned you put about four inches of compost um, sometimes, and I use about two inches. Um, it really varies depending on the base soil that you have, but I, I never really plant directly in compost. I always have like a soil medium. So I, I would say just, Yeah. And I'd say the same. I that's why some when I put compost on top, I, I might mix it in a little bit. Or actually, I'm I don't know if you saw my two piles, but I'm mixing compost in with a little bit of soil, and um, and then I'll plant directly into that. Um, and I I don't know if I mentioned. I think it's in the slide deck somewhere. But I put compost on three times a year. So each time I'm planting out, I'll amend my beds with more compost. And you really. Um, another thing I think I forgot to say is, you know, you go to the nursery and you get so excited and you buy all these seedlings and you get home and you don't have compost. I know Kathleen alluded to this, but make sure you have everything you need on hand before you buy your seedlings. You want to have that compost. You want to do your bed prep because you get home with the seedlings and I can tell you what you're going to do. <laughs> you're going to oh, die. <laughs> and I'll just put these in and I'll, you know, I'll get to it. And you don't, it's just human nature. So make sure you have your compost on hand or go ahead and amend the bed first and then go to the nursery. So you're not so tempted to buy the cute little seedlings before your beds are ready. Yeah. Yeah. And when I cover crop, I just, I just cut down my cover crop and mulch, I don't compost because my cover crop is doing all that for me. Okay, so you're not adding compost with each crop that you're okay. not when in ground in ground cover cropping. Yeah, in ground is different. I would say for a raised bed, I would three times a year I'd add a yeah, compost. I agree. Yeah. Um, the next one's um, regarding mulch using alfalfa hay or straw or pine straw. Yeah, you know. they're great. They're all good. Cover your soil. Yeah, especially if you want an acidic soil. Go, go get some leaves from your neighbor's redwood tree or some <laughs> pine needles. There's um, in San Francisco where I used to live on my way home, there was these pine needles and I would go and take them at night. <laughs> you heard it here first <laughs> well if they're on cement you know obviously you don't want to take anything from the tree but if they're on cement and they're not going to make its way back over to the tree yeah. um you hate yeah, to just see them leaves, oak leaves on cement you know don't steal the oak tree's leaves but if they're going to get blown by the gardener go take them yeah that makes such nice compost oh it's yeah. beautiful yeah, um, and this is more of a, so a soil question as well, but maybe you can um, answer this one as, how do you uncompact the soil, I guess? For broad fork. Our... Yeah. Yes. Um, I bought a broad fork. It has, it's about five feet across. You're kidding. It has 18 inch tines, and you put it in the ground, you step on it, and you rock it back and forth, you pull it out. This is what I did to my front lawn. It took a day. Um, yeah. You pull it out, you go forward a little bit, you step on it, you rock it back and forth. Um, be careful of your irrigation pipes because mm -hmm. <laughs> it will puncture your irrigation pipe. But um, broad fork is how I would uncompact my soil. And then I would ask also cover crop for at least one season with daikon radish seed, also called oil seed radish. And it, it gets a root like, I don't know, 18, 20 inches and it gets big and fat. And just after it's, after the 
the top is pretty tall and just before it's starting to flower, cut off the, cut it off at the base, but leave the radish in the ground. And as it decomposes, it will feed your soil, feed your life. It holds nitrogen, it stops nitrogen from leaching and it, it's wonderful at opening up your soil. Yes. Also, I've heard Terry say, I think, um, if you broad fork, you can also then put compost down those holes that you're making yeah. with the broad fork. I, I put compost first and then I broad fork and it just okay. kind of naturally goes in. into the holes. Yeah, yeah. because you, right. you're just trying to get what, if you have dead soil, um, compacted soil is dead soil. And then that's actually called dirt instead of soil. You're just trying to bring it back alive. And so you've got to add life to it. Which... And you need air, you need uh, at least 25% air in your soil. Yeah. 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 Great. Um, so this is a question regarding starting seeds. Can seeds be started outside without a greenhouse? Depends on the seed. Okay. <laughs> well, well good yeah. enough for me. <laughs> the, the warm season crops like tomatoes and things are better kept in a warm place right. because they'll germinate faster. Um, there's actually, if you Google germination temperature, temperature chart, you'll see the temperature where seeds germinate at the, at the best temperature for the seeds to germinate and the cool season crops, they'll germinate in cooler temperatures. Yeah. I mean, spinach actually wants a fairly cold soil to germinate. Yeah. Um, but tomatoes need what, like 75 or something to germinate. Yeah. You know what I do, but this is probably not, um, like passable by the fire department or something but I just get an electric blanket and when I was starting lots and lots of seeds like when I was starting hundreds of seeds um I would just get an electric blanket I'd put my um I grow it in these things they're like would you put a tarp over the electric blanket uh yeah yeah I'd put a tarp and it, to keep it dry yeah. but and then I'd turn it on till all my uh soliantia seeds had germinated and then I'd turn the electric blanket off um, I didn't have a greenhouse per se, but I, I kind of hijacked one of our rooms in our house and that's how I started all my seeds. But my brassica seeds that I start, like my spring and fall things, I, um, I start those out in a little, my garden shed, which isn't really a greenhouse because um, yeah. they don't need, they don't need bottom heat. I also have bottom heat. You can buy little heating pads for seed starts and I have like three or four of those. And so it's all about temperature soil. But then after the little seed germinates, after the, that little seed comes up, um, you'll have plastic over it because you're kind of making a mini greenhouse when you, when you seed. So you have your soil, your bottom heat, if it's a summer thing, and then you put a little piece of plastic. I use just the liner of a cereal, um, put it over. And then after those little seeds pop up, make sure you take the plastic off because they don't need to photosynthesize till they germinate and then they need to photosynthesize. Um, so, and that makes a little mini greenhouse. It'll, um, the water will evaporate and, um, and I've had very, I've had good luck with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, this question is for Lisa. Um, what are the screens made from that your husband made? I'm guessing the, um, it's just chicken wire, but it's not half inch chicken wire. It's quarter inch chicken wire. And he made a frame. Is it that is the ask is the question on the frame itself? Uh, I'm not sure both. actually they didn't say. Okay. Yeah. Well, you can see it kind of behind me. It's my screen saver thing, but um, yeah. he just, he made a, uh, he made like a wooden thing. So it got to be the right um, dimension. And then he just took half inch pipe and he uh, put it across there. I don't know exactly how he did it, uh, but he did three of those uh, for the frame and then just put a quarter inch chicken wire and just uh, wrapped it. And it's great. It looks, I must say it's neat. It's tidy. I can even move out of the way. I think uh, too much sun in my, um, Anyway, it, it looks nice and he wants things tidy um, because he doesn't like to look at messy things. And you could also use PVC instead of the half inch wire, uh, half inch pipe. 
Yeah, if you can make it into that diameter, you can. You know, I don't know if PVC would be, it, it might be too brittle. Yeah. Huh. Okay. okay. If he wants to email me, I could probably send uh, him what my husband did. Sure. Um, okay. So what can you do about roaches taking up residence in your garden mulch and propagating? Roaches? I'm guessing cockroaches. <laughs> oh, I haven't heard that happen. <laughs> me neither. Um, you know, I don't, I, what I can say, you know, if you're doing compost, you know, usually you put, it gets up to like 150. Um, so it's going to kill most of the, I'm just wondering if, I think this sounds to me more like a composting problem than a insect problem. But if your compost is hot enough, you're not going to have roaches live in there. The outside of it does cool off. The outside isn't as warm as the inside of it. So, I mean, I have had little, um, they're so cute, um, <laughs> like little possums, little like baby things kind of in the out. I, when I build a pile, I build a big pile. Um, so it might be five feet by five feet. And um, I will have some things take residence, but I haven't had roaches and um, so that's, a, I would turn the pile. Yeah. Yeah. Turn that pile. Cause really, yeah, the pile just needs air, water, and then, uh, carbon and nitrogen. Those are the four things that go into a compost pile. Can might have a better advice than we do. Yeah. Can have a, uh, you know, I've kind of already moved on. I forgot about the question. <laughs> Oh, the roaches. Roaches. Oh, sorry. That's right. <laughs> I, I actually, I don't, I don't have any experience with roaches. Um, at least not an inside or outside the garden, maybe some insides, but no. Yeah. No answer for that one from me. Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> um, okay. So let's move on. Cause we've got quite a, quite a lot of questions here. So we've, um, got oak tree leaves do you rake it or not probably nope. not Just absolutely leave it <laughs> and then zone 7a in virginia we mulch for winter should we remove three inches of mulch for spring i'm not sure i i wouldn't remove any mulch especially in spring and summertime i don't think no yeah. i wouldn't because then you're gonna have bare soil and we hate bare soil yeah, yeah, no bare soil. I, I would never remove mulch, so, but I, I just don't, through it. yeah, I just don't know Virginia, so it's hard for me to, like, I don't know if they have special things that we don't have here, but in principle, you would never remove mulch. No, you can just plant through the mulch. Yeah. 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 This is a fertilizer question, um, and the directions on fertilizer is usually 100 feet of plant. I only have a few plants for each. How much of the 888 or 101010 fertilizer should I apply to? Yikes! <laughs> I would say zero. <laughs> if, if, um, so this is my two cents. You know, everybody do what you want. But um, if, if you're buying fertilizer and it's 888 or 101010, I'm it's doubting. It's not organic. I'm doubting that's organic fertilizer. I think that's more like a miracle Grow type fertilizer if, they're, if the numbers are that high and also that consistent across. You know, you might find something that's two, eight, six, that might be organic, but um, I wouldn't, personally on my own vegetables, I wouldn't put a non-organic fertilizer and, um, and I don't use any fertilizer at all because I put compost. Um, Kathleen, I don't know, you want to add anything to that? Um, I don't use any fertilizer. I, when I first moved into my house, you know, our front lawn had been fertilized clearly with synthetic fertilizer and there was nothing living in my soil. So I applied some um, chicken manure Mm -hmm. which is fairly high in nitrogen and it kind of gave it a jump start. But um, no, I would not, I, I don't use synthetic fertilizer. I, I cover crops, so I don't use fertilizer, period. Yeah, I'll second that as well. I, I don't use fertilizer. Compost is just sort of my to-go 
uh, solution for everything. But occasionally for some things, I use the BioLive fertilizer, which is very, not even, you know, anywhere close. I think it's like four to six or something like that. Yeah. But uh, it's a very gradual, slow release fertilizer um, that I use maybe once a year, a little bit here and there, but yeah. mainly just compost as the trick. Yeah. yeah. I will say, I mean, I like the down to earth products. I mm -hmm. think they're good. And I think they're an ethical company from what I can read. And so if you feel like you do need to add fertilizer, go organic, and then just make sure you're going with, um, you know, someplace that's ethical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you don't need a super high nitrogen fertilizer for any vegetable. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Um, so soil testing, do you recommend it? If so, how do they get their soil tested? <laughs> um, I, I had a very wise teacher at City College in the horticulture department, and he said, look at your plants. They will tell you how your soil is. Um, I personally have never tested my soil. If you live in an urban environment, you want to you might want to test it for heavy metals, toxins, something like that. But if your plants are thriving, you probably don't need to test your soil. Um, yeah. If you do test, you want to take samples from, um, like, in if you're growing in the ground, you would want to take them from, I would take three areas in one of my beds, three or four maybe, and I would go down to where the roots are and I would get like three tests done on each, I would get three tests, one for each bed and take the soil samples from a variety of places in that bed. Mm -hmm. And I would send them to, what's the lab can? Uh, there's, there's several of them. There's Waypoint and Earthford is the microbiology test. And then the waypoint does all the heavy metals, chemical macro micronutrients and all that. Um, but really I think, yeah, in urban environments, maybe you want to get your soil tested first um, before amending to that, just so you know, um, yeah. the lab results are, you know, they can vary from lab to lab depending on what kind of methods that they're using. So be sure to know what, what kind of testing they're doing to find yeah. these. Uh, Every test, I mean, I've had clients that have had their soil tested and almost every test I have read says add organic matter. So yeah. it's like it, you could spend hundreds of dollars getting your soil tested, but what you're really wanting gonna, gonna wanna do is add compost and mulch. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say the same thing. I did have my soil tested, oh, 10, 13 years ago, I think it was like A and G lab, or it might've just been called soil lab. Um, and, uh, and then consequently, Kathleen, I was having some problems with soil and I did have it tested. Um, Malcolm was helpful in that. And, yeah. um, um, and, but every test I've ever read and every test I've ever learned about, they always say the exact same thing is add more organic matter, add more organic matter. So mm -hmm. I'd probably, unless you have a concern like your house was painted before 1976 and you think you have lead paint or, you know, if you have a concern, by all means have it tested. But um, if your plants are thriving and you have beautiful soil, I, I wouldn't bother and I would just keep adding organic matter, mm -hmm. i.e. compost. Yeah. Okay, so um, gophers are galvanized stock tanks okay for growing veg veggies? Oh, that's what you grow yours in, Kathleen. You've yeah. done that before. Yeah, you just have to drill holes in the bottom and yeah. then place them on bricks or cinder blocks or something. So it's, so you have drainage. Yeah, okay. Uh, when planting peas after soaking, do you allow the peas to grow a small root? I don't soak my peas. I just put them in the ground. Yeah, same here. Okay. But I know people who do, they like put them between paper towels and stuff and wait till they sprout and then plant them. But I just, um, I just go ahead and put the pea itself in the ground. Okay. So uh, several co cover crop questions. I think we, we should just move on because I've sent the link for your cover crop talk um, to the chat. So, and I will share, share that with uh, the email that I'll be sending out as well. 
So we'll just move on from the cover crop questions there. Um, what's the better ground materials for weed control? Wood chips versus landscape cloth or plastic? Greenbacks. Wood chips. <laughs> yeah, wood chips. <laughs> and and oh. the bigger the wood chip, the better. Yeah, yeah they, but I mean, well, not, not like huge wood chips, but very fine little wood chips. Um, seeds will still germinate in them, but um, bigger, like two to three inch wood chips, seeds won't germinate. Mm -hmm. And they last longer. Yeah, but, but in your raised bed, you don't want to put that. In your raised bed, you want to put um, Lingso soil amendment. Is that the one I like, Can? That or the B and G or what's the? Yeah, soil conditioner. Soil can G and B soil conditioner is another good one to just put on top of your soil. On top of yeah. your compost. On top of your compost. Although on top of my compost, my compost is pretty woody, so I don't. I don't mulch on top of it. Yeah, you use your compost, your horse manure compost, like a mulch. Yeah, and, but it is composted. It's not like raw horse manure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so going on to container gardening, uh, what are some of your recommendations for growing in containers? And to add on to that, uh, can you use the same pots? You know, get the biggest pot you can. Um use what soil would you recommend for a for a pot can i really like our essential soil there you go yeah yeah it's 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 like the vegetable blend that we have with a little bit of extra mycorrhizae and and beneficial bacteria added to that and it's, it's got pea gravel so it doesn't compact and drain so it's it's quite nice and you know, a lot of people after they harvest, they throw that soil out and then they refill it with new soil. I don't do that. I've had the same soil for almost a decade now, I feel in the same pot. But what I do is I do just uh, do the aeration method where I poke holes and I add some compost within mm -hmm. the pots and I mulch the pots also. Yeah. Um, so that seems to help quite a bit. Um, so this person's asking, I read that you should not include tomatoes in your compost. Is that correct? I put mine in my compost, but I don't okay. have verticillium oil. I don't. Unless your tomato is diseased, um, you can totally compost it. If it's diseased, don't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you put on garlic in the spring? Uh, spaghetti. Butter. <laughs> 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 what does that mean what do you put on garlic in the spring? i'm guessing like on top as compost or mulch because garlic sort of mounds a bit um i'm not sure mulch i guess yeah i would guess a little bit of compost you, mulch. Could, you yeah. can mulch i on on the alien family i mean so i plant those usually october ish and um make sure you turn off the water you know, come June, you're not going to water those anymore. You want them to dry in the field. And um, if you don't have a way, like if you have other things in that bed, what I do sometimes is I'll plant garlic or onions at the end of a bed where the lines, irrigation lines stop, and then I can fold the irrigation lines back over. So you don't, you know, it's, it's hard with, if a whole bed's watered to grow aliens. It's also, um, I, I don't know if it's worth it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. sometimes it's nice just to have them in the garden. And some of the garlics are really good. But yeah. And some shallots are really good. Yeah. Having shallots around is a really nice thing to have. But it kind of gets back to that one point I was trying to make, not very eloquently. But yeah, I mean, onions and shallots are pretty inexpensive in the grocery store at a farmer's market. Um, so if you only have so much real estate, do you really want to grow onions or do you want to grow uh, a specialty crop that yeah. is super expensive at a farmer's market? And onions and, and garlic take quite a while to grow. They, they, yeah, they're in there for at least eight months. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the next, qu next question is about B1 shots. Um, Virginia says, my husband's convinced that you should always give your seedlings a shot of B1 to get them started well. Is this okay? You know, they actually, there was a study done on the B1 transplant shock. 
and they did three controls, one with B1, one with just watering, and one with just planting. And they found that the, the benefit of B1 was that people watered. <laughs> so if you write, when you plant your plants, if you water them, it will be the same benefit as the B1. Right, yeah. So what they need is water. But <laughs> it, 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 I mean, if it keeps your husband happy, then go yes. for it. It doesn't, it, har it doesn't harm them. Yeah, if it saves your marriage, by all means. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, we don't want to we don't want to like have anyone go to divorce court because of our class <laughs> um so the next question is is worm casting a fertilizer or compost should i add worm casting to seeds starting trays oh sure add it everywhere yeah i mean worm casting is really good stuff but it's also really powerful so you wouldn't want to do straight worm castings. You'd want to mix it in and you hardly need any, you know, I don't know what the ratio would be. You could look it up, but I mean, you probably need like one tablespoon per four ounces of soil or something. You know, you hardly need any worm castings because it's, it's potent. Okay. Okay. So apparently I skipped questions regarding vinegar for weed control. They want clarification regarding what kind of vinegar that you were recommending. Um, 30% is the, I have used 20% and it's not very, it, it's somewhat effective, but it's not effective at what I was trying to kill, which was field bindweed, oh. but 30% vinegar will kill field bindweed. And mm -hmm. when you open it, you will get a waft of acid in your face and it's, it's potent stuff. Yeah. This is and not for making salad dressing. No, no, <laughs> it's, it'll burn your hands. Yeah. It'll burn your nostrils, but yeah. um, it'll also burn the weed down to nothing. Yeah, I mean, the nice thing is it keeps the root in the ground, which is where you want it. Um, and, I, and you I, don't I, need a lot. You just need to, you know, just, a few drops on the weed kills it. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, and you know, First, I would still say hand pulling or cutting the tops off, but um, I have paths throughout where I live and um, they're gravel paths and you just can't, there's, I don't have a choice. I have to spray with vinegar. Yeah. And so wh why can't you use regular vinegar? That it's was not strong question. enough. Not strong enough. Okay. Yeah. Got it. You can try it. I mean, I think in some instances it's okay, but. Yeah, like if it's a wimpy little weed, but if it's a perennial weed, go 30%. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I think normal vinegar is like two to 4% or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this question is about avocados falling off before they're ready and they're really tiny. So they're asking what's missing in the soil. I don't know. <laughs> 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 it's, it's sort of like it's 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 interesting because I've got a 70 year old avocado tree in my front yard and it, sometimes it happens um you know some of the tiny ones and and the squirrels just knock them off or but if it's consistent falling of you know uh all the avocados before they go into fruition then there might be some phosphorus or potassium issues there so I'm not I'm not entirely sure I would start cover cropping. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, cover I don't know crop what... with mustards, maybe. And uh, mustards are really good scavengers. They'll pull up all kinds of nutrients that are down deep in your soil and make it available to your tree. Mm -hmm. But um, other than that, that's, it's a tough one to answer. Yeah, yeah, it could be so many, so many things. Yeah. I, I mean, it could be also that the... Or How the fruit? Often are you watering it? Are you overwatering it? Underwatering it? So yeah. I don't know. Or the fruit wasn't fertilized correctly, and it's aborting the fruit. I, you know, I don't know. I just yeah, yeah. lots of different factors. Pollinate. Yeah. Well, I think we're almost at that time where we've got to sign off here. Well, it's almost three p.m. Um, but thank you so much. 
to yeah, thank both you. you and Lisa, Lisa and Kathleen. And any other information that you need, just feel free to email me and I'm happy to forward them along to Lisa and Kathleen. And I'll be sending out the PDF as well as um, the recorded link sometime tomorrow to everybody. So Great. And thank you everybody for coming. I know everybody's totally zoomed out. So we appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank and you. Thank you, Lingso. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Yeah. See thank you, you both. Okay. Take care, everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye.